Welcome to STA National Market Structure event. I am Larry Tabb, uh, Head of Market Structure Research for Bloomberg uh, Intelligence. Bloomberg Intelligence is the research arm of Bloomberg LP. And we're filming at uh, Bloomberg Studios at 731 Lex. I want to thank the Bloomberg folks for allowing us to use this studio. And with me are two really great guests. We have Tom Callahan, Chief Executive Officer, and Brett Mock, Senior Vice President and Head of Global Capital Markets for NASDAQ Private Markets. Um, Tom and Brett, welcome to Bloomberg headquarters. Thank you very much, Larry. And let us start off by congratulating you on your Dictum May Impact Award. I think it's incredible recognition of uh, a man who is a legend in our industry. So congratulations, Larry. Thank you. I don't know about a legend, but uh, I work pretty hard. <laughs> it's an award that, uh, that the board created years ago um, uh, that I was part of. And it was about uh, giving sort of acknowledgement to people that have contributed to the betterment of our industry. And so I couldn't think of a better person to receive this award. So congratulations. Thanks, Brett. Appreciate it very much. So let, let, let's start with, with what is NASDAQ Private Markets. Tom, why don't you take this one? Um, what is NASDAQ Private Markets and what do you guys do? Sure. So NASDAQ Private Markets is actually an independent company. It was incubated within NASDAQ starting in 2013. And it was a business uh, whose idea was really generated on the back of the Jobs Act, which, as you know, the Jobs Act just made it much easier for private companies to stay private. And so I think the idea within NASDAQ was that what if we get to a world where companies are waiting longer to go public and how could NASDAQ service the needs better of private companies in terms of accessing liquidity? Uh, so we have been in this business for close to 10 years. Uh, we're the most experienced player. We've done from inception to today uh, close to $50 billion in private market transactions on our platform. And really uh, what our job and our mission is, is to bring liquidity to the private markets. Private markets, for a lot of reasons we can discuss, are very, very challenging in terms of liquidity. Uh, there's not great data. There's not great information flow. Historically, there's not been great technology to facilitate trading in the private markets. So that is the problem that NPM was built to solve. Uh, we spun out of NASDAQ just last year. And I think the recognition was that this is such a big industry-wide problem that, frankly, it's too big of a challenge for one player alone, even NASDAQ, to do independently. So we brought in a group of strategic investors Goldman Sachs, uh, Morgan Stanley, Citibank, Silicon Valley Bank. So they are our partners, they are our board members, and uh, together we're gonna try to transform the private markets. So these are generally private securities. So, so I'm a company, I issue stock, I issue to, to you know, maybe you know, some of my employees, to some of the private equity guys. You know, is, is that what you're trying to do, Be, create a secondary market for these, for these private issuances? So the short answer is yes. Uh, the longer answer is that, you know, the meta story in the private markets is the incredible growth that this asset class has seen in the last 10 years. There are now over $4 trillion in VC-backed private unicorns. Mm -hmm. And the unicorn is a funny uh, word because, you know, 10 years ago, there were 15 unicorns in the U.S. There's now over a thousand. So unicorns there are, are thousand, there are a thousand oh, companies actually, valued over a billion dollars or something closer to 1,200. Yeah. Wow. So unicorns aren't really unicorns anymore. Um, and if you compare the size of the private markets at four trillion dollars, that's four times the size of the crypto market. And there's a very small handful of players, including NPM, that are trying to figure this space out and to try to create liquidity. So. The other story is that largely, again, on the back of the Jobs Act, companies are waiting longer to go public. What has changed? Well, again, the Jobs Act made it easier. It used to be that you had 500, a limit of 500 shareholders. Jobs Act changed that to 2000. And then you had this explosive growth of the VC industry. So companies don't need to go public as quickly anymore to access capital. They can do that in the private realm. Uh, and in general, that's a very, very good thing. But what does it mean? Well, if you're an employee in a private company, uh, you still need to put your kids through college. You still need to buy houses. So at some point, you need to monetize those shares that your company has given you. And if your company is going to wait 12 years, which is the average time 
uh, that, a, that a, a company goes public. Now, that's a long time to wait. Yeah, I'm so not sure that employees hang around 12 years anymore. Yeah, well, a, the average employee sticks around for about two and a half. So if you're not creating liquidity for your employees, you have a real retention issue. So from our clients, who are, again, largely unicorns, this issue of providing employee liquidity is really an imperative. It's key to their talent retention strategy. So they need a service like the one that NASDAQ Private Market uh, provides. On the other side, you have investors. And again, companies waiting longer to go public. By the time companies go public, the hyper growth phase of that company is over. It's largely a mature, maybe fully valued company by the time they IPO. So if an, as an investor, if you want to participate in that hyper growth phase, you need to get in while the company is still private. So huge demand from investors, huge need from the asset owners, largely either early round uh, investors or more often employees, but there traditionally hasn't been a platform where those two constituents can meet in a way that's transparent, that's regulated, that's standardized, that has high trust and integrity, and that's what NPM is building. Interesting. So, so, so you're you're I'll bring, bring Brad into this a little bit. Are, are you you trying to build a marketplace, or, or you know, I I believe it's kind of a marketplace. You know, how how do, how does the marketplace kind of work, and and what is it taking its place? from or what, what how did it exist before the market kind of existed yeah i mean uh, you know anybody that's grown up in markets understands that you know fragmentation is not a good thing um you know having a, a lack of price discovery potentially is also not a great thing you know marketplaces really um are the evolution of a, a well-functioning uh, market or well-functioning you know um, asset class and um it, it feels like this is an asset class that's sort of ready to grow up and, and it's really, as I use the analogy, it's uh, the last unpaved road of the equity market um, infrastructure. And so what Tom just explained is that you had this sort of sea change where companies don't have to go public as quickly as they used to. Back in the dot-com era, they went public after you know, 12, 24 months. Now you're talking 10, 12 years. And as Tom explained, you've got a disconnect where you have the need for employees and companies to look for liquidity. And again, you have that alpha generation going on in the asset class. And so it's really, it's an investable asset class. And so if you think about what a market does is it helps basically get counterparties together and then it has governance and has rules, it has price discovery, it has data. And these are all things that need to sort of happen because then as you kind of evolve the marketplace, you eventually can get into products or indexes or funds. And so this is really a market, I think, as we talked about, there's so much alpha that's been created over the last 10 years. There's so many unicorns now that I think this is a, obviously we think that this is a marketplace that's here to stay. And we think that the industry really needs to have sort of um, a market center to really drive that price discovery and drive that liquidity. So, so um, today, is it just, you know, you know, how, how do the, how do folks get that liquidity without something like Nasdaq private markets? Is is, is it just kind of catch as catch can? You know, call somebody, try and say, hey, look, you interested in shares of XYZ Corp, or or how does that work? Yeah, it's a brokered market. You know, I mean, it's 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 fragmented, um, though it's siloed. Um, the, that price discovery stays, you know, uh, in that broker in that work or that that in that brokerage. Um, and I think that when we talk about um, trying, to, trying to grow this asset class into a huge institutional asset class, you're, you're you know, betting on the fact that you need the larger banks to also enter the space, which is what we we're doing with our partnership. And we're basically kind of giving them a business in a box where we're going to give them the technology, give them the marketplace for them to then connect to their ecosystem, which is you know, vast with between private banks, investment bank, capital markets. You're talking about the largest banks in the world. They're all building for this asset class and they're coming. And so we want to deliver that basically that marketplace and that technology for them. So, so there are a lot of constituents in this. This isn't just like a traditional Nasdaq market. It isn't just like you know brokers come in and bidding for IBM or Apple or whatever. This is almost a product that needs to. How does this? You know, what are who are the constituents and how do they kind of work together here? Yeah, it's a great question, Larry. You know, Brett used the word ecosystem. It really is, uh, and there are a lot of very different constituents within that ecosystem. Uh, certainly, the issuers are of primary importance because in general, the exactly, the companies, because when these shares uh, transfer, almost always the company needs to approve that. 
So they're- a Oh, so, so if I'm a, an employee and I work for XYZ Corp, I can't just sell them, you know, the XYZ Corp there's needs a, to have a an right okay. of first refusal or a ROFR where the company would have to authorize those share transfers. One of the okay. fundamental uh, differences between the private markets and the public uh, markets. So the company is always a critical, a uh, a critical uh, player in this ecosystem. Um, then certainly you have all the intermediaries. And when, uh, the story that Brett just told is important because it's a story of an asset class that's maturing from smaller you know, commission-driven brokers who have uh, traditionally been the ones that facilitate this market to a market that is largely becoming institutionalized, where you have the largest banks in the world that are, as we sit here today, making enormous investments in their private market infrastructure. And so we think that's a big part of the story. That's why we've aligned ourselves with the banks, because they really are the future of the private markets. And then you've got the sellers, and those sellers are uh, often two-legged individuals that are either current employees or ex-employees of a uh, of a company. You've got um, early round investors. They may be uh, VCs or GPs or whoever they are that are investors in the, uh, in the company that are looking to sell and create liquidity. And then you've got the buyers and that buyer network is global and vast because uh, investors all over the world are looking to invest largely in US unicorns. And the majority of unicorns are US based companies. We think that changes in time, but right now very much focused on the US market. So we have Asian investors, European investors, South American investors that all want to buy in to, to this U.S. Uh, unicorn private market. So it's a matter of stitching together that global network into one sort of coherent liquid market. And so you're right, it is vast. Uh, it's a challenge, but that's why you need great technology like what NPM is delivering. So, so um, are we, you know, in terms of investors, are you talking um, individuals or institutions? Are are the big mutual fund guys or the are, are are you know the traditional pensions and asset managers getting this? So now I know that they invest with private equity. They park some money with you know Silver Lake and Warburg Pincus and those guys, but are they also going to be customers of this as well? Yeah, I mean, I think um, if you've looked at again like the alpha that's been created over the last sort of ten years, you know, historically those companies would have been added to the S and P five hundred. And they would have been in everyone's 401k plan. Uh, instead, they stayed in the private market uh, with private market investors. And I think that if you look at the long only industry where they've had to try to stay relevant and competitive against quantitative and passive investing and indexing, um, this, is a, this is a buy and hold market. And it actually for active management community, it actually fits their, their, their strategy, which is basically knowing a company, doing your research, valuing it, and then putting it in a portfolio. So yes, to, to answer your question, the um, the largest mutual funds in the world are, are um, allocating a percentage to this alternative asset class. You've got um, hedge funds that now are called crossovers that basically take a big position uh, or a big portfolio position in this. You've got uh, the family office uh, network globally that is a prime asset class for them. And then you've got you know um, sort of service providers that, that allow for the two-legged individual to also um, access this as asset class through SPVs. So you you can bundle a bunch of smaller people into sort of one block or one sort of you know limited SPV for them to be able to have that sort of institutional size transaction. Um, and that SPV growth is uh, you can see across some of the other providers in the industry. So it is allowing for sort of the retailization of that. What we think needs to happen though is again is to get you know data pricing governance, all those things that, that the institutional community needs to really build around an asset class. And then we think that actually evolves where eventually you're going to be able to have the retail access to this asset class, which it should, because again, that, that alpha is happening that if we believe in a you know, saving ownership society, you want people to, to be awarded for that you know, saving. And I think that has to come from some of these, you know, um, some of these private market assets. I mean, I think that's the, that's the point of the last 10 years was that there's all that growth that happened. Is that kind of the, the, the reason to a certain extent you've taken in other investors so it was about a year and a half ago? I think does that tie into the distribution and, and that whole chain? A absolutely. I think that's core to who we are as a company is, you know, we want to partner with the largest banks in the world, leverage their distribution, leverage their brands, uh, leverage their ability to uh, raise capital. Uh, we want to be a platform that facilitates that, but we don't want to be doing that ourselves. We don't have uh, brokers on our team that are matching trades. We're a technology provider, we're a marketplace, we're a platform, 
and we're going to make that platform available to everyone in a very open access model. We're not a closed vertical. We're trying to decrease friction, not monetize friction through technology. And now if I'm not mistaken, you guys have registered uh, as an ATS. Uh, I'm not sure um, you know, you're fully through that process, but what will being an ATS do for you guys? We, um, so we are an ATS. Oh, you are an ATS. Yeah, okay. because uh, obviously to, uh, to settle uh, transactions uh, through a broker dealer, you have to be uh, an ATS. Okay. Uh, and also we have price discovery currently. I mean, we've run over 650 programs with, as he said earlier, about $50 billion for you know, all these companies over the last 10 years. And in a lot of those programs, there is a, a marketplace uh, where there's actually like a, a price discovery, bids and offers, like for what we did, for instance, for Coinbase, where we actually built like a, a big marketplace that traded before their direct listing. So in order to do that, you have to have an ATS, which is basically obviously the equivalent exchange. The, what's gonna change though, is that right now we're the only sort of broker in our own ATS, because again, we worked with these companies over the last 10 years. What we wanna change is we wanna allow this ATS, as Tom just explained, to become more of an exchange and let the brokers basically step into the role um, of representing buyers and, and doing the capital introduction and really acting as that broker of record and, and us stepping out of that role as a and just be the marketplace, as well as be able to streamline this sort of fragmented um, pre-match post-match process so that we can give the technology to the banks to settle these transactions. Because that's another one of the flaws of the market is it takes a very long time to settle the transactions. It can take 30 days, 40 days, 60 days. Oh, so we're, we're not in a T plus one environment. <laughs> we're not in a T plus one environment, but if you think Well, I guess about, if you got yeah, a lot of paperwork and a lot of, you know, you've got to, and I've got to give you papers, my lawyer's got to approve them, the company's somehow involved in approving this, that doesn't seem like a very straight through process. Well, yeah, I mean, I think the private markets are uh, probably resemble the public markets uh, 50 years ago, frankly, maybe 75 years ago. There are a lot of very manual processes, and that's what we are trying to fix. Um, you know, if you think about great technology, it takes complicated processes and it simplifies them. It removes friction. And frankly, buying a share in a private company now uh, has a lot more in common with buying a New York City co-op than it does a share of Apple. As you say, it's wet signatures and it's documents and it's just a lot of manual processes and those things are the enemy of liquidity. But through great technology, which is what we've built in our building, we can streamline and automate a lot of that. We're never gonna take it all the way to where the public markets are. But if we can decrease friction by half or three quarters, this is, as Brett said, going to become an investable asset class. And that's what we're aiming for. Now, wasn't blockchain supposed to solve all this? You know, um, weren't I supposed to, wasn't I supposed to be able to register my private securities on the blockchain and all of a sudden miraculously I'd find a buyer and it'd be done yeah. in like a heartbeat? Well, the, the critics of blockchain have called it a uh, solution in search of a problem. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, private markets may be the problem that blockchain was designed to solve. It really is the very perfect application uh, you know, for for what needs to happen. So that's a very important part of our strategy going well, forward. Well, I know NASDAQ has invested heavily in creating crypto infrastructures or blockchain infrastructure. Are you going to look to take some of that technology and, and integrate that? Yeah, I mean, our alignment with NASDAQ is one of our great advantages um, for a whole bunch of reasons. You know, I think there has been, again, due to the fragmented nature of the private markets, a fundamental lack of trust from a lot of participants. And with an iconic brand, like NASDAQ, we walk into the room and immediately we, we are able to bring that trust and that credibility. They all also have an enormous amount of expertise, not only in crypto, but in terms of helping us build our core technology, helping us um, uh, uh, craft data products and distribute. They're just enormously helpful and uh, they remain um, one of our, our largest shareholders and one of our most important partners. So we, we can't, uh, and this conversation, not that we're over yet, but uh, the market has been pretty volatile in the last, you know, this year, you know. Um, it, does this benefit you? Does this harm you? You know, in some ways, I think, you know, you know, if the market is down, people want a liquidity event. On the other hand, do you really want a liquidity event with the market down so much? You know, how does, how does or doesn't it play into to what's going so on? So I'd say in the short term, um, it's a market that is, I won't say it's closed, but volumes uh, are down substantially, and this is across anyone who's that's a participant, a market uh, public markets, private markets, volumes are down very, very substantially because we just haven't 
reached a new normal. We haven't reached equilibrium. There still is an enormous demand for liquidity from holders of private assets, uh, but largely companies have not yet sort of fully revalued themselves to the 2022 reality. And that reality is probably most immediately reflected in the public market. So there's definitely a, a gap there. Uh, there are buyers in the private markets. Again, uh, there is a very, very broad uh, group of investors that want to be buying into the most dynamic, high growth companies in the world. What we're seeing is those bids are, uh, if not at distress levels, close to it. So we have a very, very wide bid offer, as we said, but that can't last forever. Right. Uh, it's a bit like holding a beach ball under the water. Uh, that's the demand for liquidity. and. Every month that goes by where liquidity isn't released, it just compounds and builds. So this market is going to reach equilibrium. Um, and you know, it's actually, frankly, giving us as a young technology company time to really build out our platform. So I don't know, uh, I'm not smart enough to figure out when the Fed is done uh, uh, hiking rates and when inflation goes back to 2% or when the VIX stops below 20, but those things we all know will happen. And when they do, and this market hits equilibrium, we're gonna be there and we're gonna be ready. And we think this pent up demand from essentially close to a now coming on, you know, a year closure of these markets is gonna be enormous and we wanna be ready for that. There's actually a good point there in what he just said. And that is that I think you know, as this asset class needs to mature, it also really basically needs uh, issuers need to really understand that they have, you know, uh, liquidity needs for their employees that we talked about. And, and it's really an, it's employee retention strategy, you know, and, and if you all of a sudden don't have any liquidity or you're not allowed to sell your equity for years upon, you know, on end, you, you, they can walk across the street to go work for a public company. You know, and get played in stock. So I think one of the other um, sort of educational components of this market that needs to happen is letting a NASDAQ private market, letting our bank partners really start to really educate issuers about how they can actually run these programs regularly. You know, we call them company sponsored liquidity programs. And then it starts to look like an ESOP program, just like a just like a regular public company would. And that actually makes a lot of sense because if you have a line of sight on liquidity as an employee and you have vesting and you can plan for that when you want to buy the house, you put your kid in college, it's a it's almost a kind of a fairness thing. Plus then the company can still control the investors it wants in its cap table. So in some ways, it's a win-win because a, a company can basically allow for a program to occur regularly, and then it can still choose the um, cap table participants uh, that it wants to invite because they're a private company. They don't have to be quarterly reporting, or you know, they can still choose who they want to come to and who they can come to company. And then again, it's just it's unlocking more of that liquidity and that origination into a market that really w wants it, and that, that's where the investable asset class comes from, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that the you know, if you look at an employee and you're looking at compensation plans and people all, always want stock, the problem is if you have stock in a private company and there's no liquidity event, then, you know, eventually you kind of think it's worthless because you can't get out of it. Well, exactly. Uh, you know, going forward, uh, what we think a lot of companies are going to view liquidity as something that needs to be programmatic, not episodic. It can't just be something you offer your employees Three when you or when you're trading at a 25% premium to your last funding round. Uh, who knows when those days are coming back. So ultimately, as an employee retention strategy, companies need to do this. It can't just be every so often or random. It should be something that's scheduled, planned, that employees can then start you know, counting on year in and year out. We think that's the right way, and that's what we're trying to facilitate. Interesting. Uh, last question. So what does future state look like? What, what do you, you know, how do you think this matures? You know, um, what does this look like? Yeah, so uh, as I said, I mean, we're going to get past this uh, this period of, of macro instability, but ultimately the forces that have been propelling growth in the private market that is taking this to a $4 trillion asset class, we don't think those are changing. And, and in fact, this, this episode and the shutdown in the IPO market, I think is going to encourage companies to stay private even longer. So there are forecasts that in the next decade that this market could go from 4 trillion to 15 trillion, who knows? So, you know, we think these powerful macro forces driving growth of the private markets are going to continue. And so there's going to be a need for liquidity. There's going to be a need for incredible data. I mean, that's the urgent unmet need in these markets. Things that you can get on the internet in 10 seconds in the, in the, pro, in the public markets are completely inaccessible in, in the private markets. And so there's a need for better data. There's a need for uh, technology that streamlines these complicated processes. Um, and there's a need for trust. And we think NPM delivers all three. So 
Our theory, our thesis is that this is a asset class that's going to continue to grow. We want to be a key player in the growth of that market. With that, I want to thank um, Tom Callahan, CEO of NASDAQ Private Markets, and Brett Mock, Head of Capital Markets at NASDAQ Private Markets. I'm Larry Tabb, uh, Head of um, Market Structure Research at Bloomberg Intelligence, and we'll see you at STA National in Washington.